My name is Helge Mölman and I will chairing the session um, together uh, with um, Dr. Tarantini and we have a very, um, well it's not complete yet, um, we um, have a panel, it's Dr. Rück and Dr. Kim, Dr. Hosa will join us um, in a second. Um, when we are talking about the accurate device, um, we are talking about this valve and I would like to um, take the opportunity to make you familiar a little bit with the um, system. It's a self-expanding valve uh, made out of nitinol. Uh, we have stabilization arches at um, the upper part of the valve which uh, help to self-align the valve during um, deployment. Um, this is a feature which is very important. Um, only during deployment afterwards um, it's not meant for anchoring. We have the upper crown um, here, this part, and um, this helps to capture the native leaflets and to provide um, coronary clearance. We have the lower crown um, with minimal protrusion in the LVOT in order to uh, minimize the risk of conduction system interference. The valve is um, a supra analog valve um, yielding low gradients, and we have a pericardial skirt in order to reduce the paravalvular leak. The valve is um, available in three different sizes, ranging from 21 to 27 millimeters. Importantly, the um, landing zone um, is uh, very um, great. So we have seven millimeters of landing zone, um, so the valve is very forgiving during um, the implantation. Here's the delivery system, um, which is um, a very flexible delivery catheter, um, makes it easy to track um, the valve over the aortic um, arch. And then we have um, the handle on the right-hand side with two rotation knobs for a stepwise release of um, the valve. Um, here you can see how it works. Um, the first you have to position the valve. We will see that in more detail during the case in a couple of minutes. Um, then in a second, uh, in the first step, you have to release uh, the stabilization arches. The valve will then self-align in uh, the aorta. And um, last but not least, um, the um, full release uh, will take place. And a very short um, example is um, given here. First, uh, the stabilization arches and the upper crown. And in the second step, on the right-hand side, um, the release of the valve, uh, which goes very quickly. Having said that, I would like to um, come to the first speaker, Dr. Rück, who is going to present a case and a short uh, movie of um, the implantation of an accurate device. Uh, thank you, Helge, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'd like to show you a short case. So this is going to be a six-minute video, basically uh, demonstrating the features of this uh, valve system. Uh, I would encourage during the video that if you have any questions, uh, send them uh, in over the app, and uh, also the panelists are uh, I'm happy if there are any questions or comments. My conflicts of interest. Uh, in summary, what we, you are going to see is a case of an elderly gentleman with a, with a very severe aortic stenosis with a velocity of 5.5 meters per second, a tricuspid valve, heavily calcified with sub, sub annular calcification. You will see it in pictures in a minute. The annulus was measured to about 25 millimeters per meter drive on CT. The transfemoral axis was uh, acceptable with about six millimeters diameter and on both sides calcifications in the vessels. So the procedure plan was to do a transfemoral procedure through a 20 French uh, cook sheath. It was maybe mentioned that the accurate system is a 18 French uh, system, but it doesn't go through all uh, 18 French sheets. So in our experience, this uh, quite thin walled and hydrophilic 20 French sheets is a good option for this valve. Plan was to predilate with a true balloon, 24 millimeters. It's generally recommended to predilate most or all patients with this valve system. And that's what we have been doing also in the now over 200 cases we have done with this valve system. Plan was to use the accurate Neo uh, large valve. And uh, sorry, the AS should not be there. 
and uh, if, pos if needed, we would postulate with the same balloon size. So this is the case. Uh, in addition to what I just mentioned, uh, there were some minor other diseases, including a PCI. These are the measurements of the annulus. We can focus here and see uh, that there is here uh, subannular calcium extending down almost one centimeter below the valve plane, which could be a small challenge to a valve in re with respect to sealing. This is the access, right side, uh, quite tortuous. It's difficult to read here, but the smallest measurement is a little bit over six millimeters here. Then coming to the left side soon. Measurement here, approximately the same, six millimeters minimal diameter. The stent and valve was already demonstrated by uh, Dr. Mullman. So now it's the movie, the recording is starting here. Setup is the general one that most are using with two femoral punctures. My colleague, Dr. Settigren, is wiring the ventricle. We will see soon that we will have a uh, shaped guide wire in the ventricle. You could use any 0035 guide wire with this valve system. We typically use a Amplatz Ultra Stiff, which we bend ourselves, but it's possible to use any other pre-bent or other 0035 stiff wire. So, oh, sorry. Oh. Can I go back one? Please, let's see, sorry for that. Go to here, this is a pre-dilatation. Like I said, it's a requirement for most patients to do the pre-dilatation. It doesn't need to be uh, with the oversized balloon or anything. So in this case, it's a 24 balloon in a 25 annulus. You see, it's a true balloon, it's a brief pacing, and the uh, recovery of the blood pressure is almost instantaneous here. Then uh, comes the valve system. It comes with a small loader piece here, which uh, makes the entrance uh, to the sheath a bit easier. This piece is similar to the one, for example, seen on the Edwards S3 system. This now is the valve coming up through the arch. It's very soft, it follows the outer curve very easily. No force required almost. You see here, this dark part is the stent holder. It's part of the delivery system. The stent starts, the valve stent starts from here and goes up to here. And we'll see with the positioning in, in a minute. Uh, the deployment of the valve is quite simple, uh, but uh, wh what uh, you should uh, pay attention to is just that you do the aiming well. And that's why we go forward very slowly here. We're trying to keep, and it's also, it happens by itself that you go in the outer curve, which means that you have lots of stabiliz stabilization here from the outer curve of the aorta. So typically the uh, positioning is quite easy and you go slowly forward all the time. Sorry, here, play again. Not quite there yet. What we aim for is to be at seven millimeters when we start the deployment. Small puffs of contrast. Usually the need for larger volumes of contrast uh, is, is not necessary here. It's enough with small puffs just to confirm the position. Pushing uh, still on the catheter, deliver catheter here, and we soon be on. Oh. Sorry for that. Uh, here, yes. So now we have deployed uh, the number one here, number one handle, which means this, the upper crown is open, the stabilization arches are open, but this part still is not open. This is the so-called top-down deployment, which means you will have stabilization from this part of the stand, and this part will basically lie still, and wh when we open number two, you will see this will fly open almost like with a balloon expandable valve, which will come quite soon here. We'll confirm the position, take back the pigtail soon. See, we're in the same position as where we started. The implantation depth can be judged here, and it's about seven millimeters here. So now comes number two. My colleague just removed this so-called safety knob, so we don't do this at wrong moment. 
and you see it flies open here. If we look here, what happens is the second capsule has been opened and has been pushing this uh, nose cone a bit into the ventricle. See the hemodynamics are stable all the time during deployment typically. We're retrieving the system through the valve and then reassembling the system soon here in the descending aorta. Typically the delivery system is in the body of the patient around five minutes in our experience, so it's a quite short procedure in that respect. What typically follows after this is echocardiography to confirm or rule out leak. Now this picture is not so good, but in this case we observed what we thought was a grade one leak and we wanted to correct that with post dilatation. So therefore we reused the same 24 millimeter balloon we had used for pre dilatation. We position the balloon and then uh, simply with the rapid pacing uh, do the post dilatation. As with other self-expanding devices, it could be good to wait uh, a couple of minutes for the final assessment of the PVL since it's probably expanding a couple of minutes after deployment. So you shouldn't really rush the post dilatation balloon. Soon the post dilatation will start, I guess. Here's the pacing. Here's the post dilatation. You can see that the balloon uh, touched the stent, but uh, didn't expand uh, in millimeters very much. We will do our final assessment of the leak after this. Now, in this movie, you'll only see the uh, autogram here with uh, what we thought was maximum uh, grade one leak and maybe even a trace only good positioning of the valve. Maybe we should go back just to the last picture here to show what we intend. So here you can see the implantation depth and final depth here. This first intersection of the first cell is, is seven millimeters, which means the implantation depth is slightly less than seven. It's about five millimeters. The upper crown typically lands just below the left main, and this part is not covered with any skirt, which means the access to, to the corners should be fine after this. And you'll also see that this part residing in the ascending aorta, is, uh, there is very little material here. And the valve itself starts here and is super annular and goes down to here, so it's a super annular functioning valve. That was the case. Um, so the main point here, this valve system has been described as TAVI for dummies. I'm not sure it's completely true. But what's true is that the most important step is the positioning before the step one and step two of the deployment starts, which means if you do accurate aiming, you will land this accurate valve in the right spot uh, with a very high likelihood. It's easy to learn. It doesn't take many procedures to learn uh, these steps. There are very few steps. The procedure is quite fast. The delivery system is flexible. It will go up through any anatomy almost. Uh, and in our experience, it's suitable for a wide range of patients. Most patients in our institution are treated with this system. I think maybe these results in the box at the bottom have been shown before. Uh, we did an analysis together with a Swiss center and also a Danish center, and in short, in 175 patients, we had 2% permanent pacemaker, 5% PVL, 2% stroke, and 1% mortality. So it shows that this valve system, in our opinion, strikes a quite good balance uh, with regards to the results. Okay, thank you, Andreas. I think you have shown a perfect case in terms of clinical and anatomical selection for this type of valve because you have you had a, an adverse root features that means the calcium that is creeping down to the outflow of the ventricle. This is important to have a self-expandable valve. At the same time, from the anatomical perspective, you had a very aligned 
aorta compared to the ventricle, you don't have an horizontal you know, mismatch or orientation of the ventricle compared to the aorta. So let's try to get the, the things as simple as possible, but not simpler. So I would like to challenge you, uh, uh, you a little bit, um, looking at some more you know, tips and tricks that you use when you face unfavorable anatomy. So let's start with the starting point. For you, the ring that you have in the middle of the valve, which is the correct position to start with. Could you comment first yes, of all of uh, this? Yes, there is not a, uh, a Do you particular be able, ring, like, but like, if you excuse look. Excuse me, excuse yes. me. So the point is that comparing to the Edwards, yes. do you use this ring like the market bead of the Sabian, that means two millimeter above, or you prefer to stay two millimeter below, one millimeter below in this case? I would say the marker which you will see when you use Accurate, it's the seven millimeter band. It's the first intersection of the cells. Uh, we try to position that exactly at the annulus because what happens usually is during this deployment, the valve goes cranial about two millimeters, which means you start at seven and end up at five, which we think is perfect. So again, when you have the valve that is not properly aligned, like the case that you showed before, what are the tricks that you use to try to orientate a little bit better the valve or the ring? Because sometimes when you are perfectly in orthogonal view, the ring is not probably like a line, it's still like a circle. Do you use the double check trying to find out the orthogonal view also for the valve, which is the tricks that you use when you have problem of misalignment. Yes, uh, in our experience, the final picture of the expanded and delivered valve is usually with, the, with respect to the angulation of the C arm is very close to what we predicted by CT, which means it's rare to have a problem uh, of coaxiality with this valve since it's quite soft and it's pushed through the outer curve. It means it usually comes uh, at the angle which, which is quite close. In some cases, we have corrected a few degrees. That's true, but it's not a major problem, I think, with this device. I think one of the major one of the major points is um, that you have this generous landing zone of seven millimeters, and therefore it's not really so important as it is with other um, devices to really be perfectly aligned. Um, therefore, I think it's um, very reasonable, as you just um, told, to, to use uh, the pre-procedural CT and um, take that as um, the first um, angulation and then go on from this, and um, you usually um, end up with a perfect result. And then, uh, um, I have a comment on positioning also. Uh, Andreas, I think in your uh, example, you really nicely showed that um, uh, this valve can be implanted very easily. And uh, it was shown that the upper crown during positioning was just above the native calcifications. And when we first train um, new operators, we recommend to uh, orientate on the um, uh, so-called marker band, which is uh, around seven millimeters. Uh, what is your opinion on uh, uh, regarding the, the upper crown uh, to the, to, uh, in, regard, uh, in, uh, in relation to the native uh, calcification? Well, I think uh, still after 200 cases, we're mainly watching the seven millimeter band, I must say, still. Uh, although if you would uh, watch the upper crown, the upper part of that, it would give you the same result, I'm sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think we can hand over to Wong Kim. The title of his presentation is Insights from the CFE Transpamal 8000 Registry. Dear chairs, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's It's an honor and a privilege to um, present the data from the SAR VTF registry on behalf of all the investigators. Yes. So here my conflicts. And um, this post-market registry has been um, performed after CE mark um, of uh, the Symmetus Accurate Neo device, uh, which was in summer of 2014. Uh, it's a self-expanding uh, device. Uh, Helga already showed you the features. Uh, this registry was a multi-center, all-commerce registry, 
treatment was done according to standard care and uh, approval for this registry was given in September of 2014. And uh, it was the aim to um, include the first 1,000 consented patients and uh, around 25 centers were uh, participating uh, within a time uh, frame of uh, one and a half years. These are the endpoints, primary endpoint, all cause mortality at 30 days, and here you can see the secondary endpoints, which are procedural success, device performance at seven days and one year, VAC2 safety criteria at 30 days and 12 months, and uh, also clinical parameters. Here you can see the uh, enrollment. Uh, um, um, I already mentioned 25 sites um, across uh, six countries in Europe were um, contributing to this um, registry. And the baseline characteristics show of all 1,000 patients um, uh, intermediate to high risk population, as you can see, uh, aged um, over 80 years old, Logis Euroscore 18, um, SDS around 6% with um, severe aortic stenosis and uh, highly symptomatic. Here are the acute outcomes. You may have seen these um, outcomes previously. Uh, we have data from all 1,000 patients. Procedure success was very high low frequency of uh, um, second uh, valve implantation, very low frequency of surgery or aborted procedure. And I may draw your attention to the relatively short device usage time, which was only around six minutes. And uh, this is defined as the time from insertion of the delivery system and uh, until removal from uh, post implant. And this is also our daily experience that this device can be implanted very easily. You can see the high procedure success. And uh, I think if you're uh, experienced, it is possible to really um, uh, deploy this valve within one or two minutes. This might be favorable, uh, is, uh, especially in case of hemodynamic compromise after uh, pre-ballooning, which rarely happens. Here are performance data at seven days. Uh, you may be familiar with, with these, and at 12 months. And you can see that the gradient, which is uh, at discharge um, around eight millimeters uh, of mercury, is sustained after one year, which is very remarkable, and stays in a very low range. Um, also the uh, mean EOA. And here you can see uh, data of PVL grade, which is also very important. Uh, from 966 patients versus around 600 patients after one year. And uh, um, also the, the, the rate of at least moderate PVL was relatively low with around 4%. This was sustained at one year. Here are the uh, MACE data of almost all patients, all cause mortality, very remarkable, uh, low with 1.4%. Uh, and uh, also at one year, only 8%, below 10%. And also th the fact that the cardiovascular mortality was very low uh, indicates that uh, most people, most patients died from, um, uh, from different causes. Stroke rate, very low with uh, 1.9 uh, MI and re-intervention. And um, also have a look at the uh, new pacemaker implantation, Helge. Uh, mentioned the specific design with low protrusion into the LBOT, and this results uh, in a um, clinically relevant matter in a very low pacemaker rate, which is among the lowest um, uh, currently known uh, in uh, all devices. This is also sustained at one year, relatively low. Um, here are VAC2 events, um, also from a, a high proportion of patients, you, s you have seen all cause mortality, stroke, bleeding, and this is uh, another very remarkable fact that uh, the rate of coronary obstruction among 1,000 patients, there was no case of acute coronary uh, impairment. And at 12 months, there was only one case. And this is also um, mainly uh, attributed to the specific anatomy and the upper crown which may keep uh, the native uh, leaflets and calcification away from the coronary ostia. 
you can see repeat procedure uh, and uh, a re re very low uh, proportion of patients with at least one VARC2 event. This is a uh, one-year survival and uh, a specific um, yeah, characteristic of, of this um, um, yeah, probably limitation of this analysis was that um, uh, for uh, um, some patients or some centers it was allowed to um, uh, get informed consent after the procedure, which can be a, um, a major bias. Therefore, we uh, separately analyzed patients with uh, consent post-procedure and pre-procedure, and you can see that there was no uh, relevant difference regarding mortality. Of course, this is a limitation. In terms of clinical improvement, um, in uh, one of the last sessions we talked about uh, importance of quality of life. You can see that there was a major improvement after 30 days uh, with sustained um, success after one year. So I may conclude um, this presentation uh, I think, I hope to sh uh, have shown you that one-year outcomes of the Alkama Savi TF registry confirmed the safety and uh, efficacy of the accurate neo transcatheter heart valve system with single-digit mortality, and even after one year, which is very remarkable, single-digit mean gradient um, due to the super uh, annular um, design, minimal PVL, which, of course, there is room for improvement, and um, among lowest new PPM rates in TAVI. Thank you. And thank you very much for presenting these uh, nice data. Um, I would propose uh, that we continue with the next talk and then um, can discuss um, the results together. So um, I would like uh, to introduce Dr. Husa, who is going to uh, present uh, the results of the MORINA study, um, a comparative data analysis. Thank you very much, dear ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be given the opportunity to present the MORINA study, which should open. OK. Um, these are my conflicts of interest. So basically, nowadays, uh, there are two main techniques for deploying transcatheter heart valves, self-expanding valves or balloon-expandable valves. By balloon-expandable valves, uh, it's basically the Sapien 3 on the market. There are several self-expanding valves, and um, there are several differences attributed to each technique. For example, some people enjoy the higher radial force of balloon-expandable valves. The uh, supravalvular function of the self-expanding devices is uh, at times uh, beneficial for lower gradients, and uh, self-expanding devices sometimes have the ability to be retrieved or resheathed. So there are different advantages to each technology. And both technologies were compared in a randomized fashion with earlier generation devices, the Sapien XT and the Corva, if you all know the choice trial. It was uh, um, uh, the first randomized trial on this topic uh, performed in high-risk patients, and um, there was uh, um, significant superiority of the balloon expandable valve over this, the self-expanding valve uh, regarding device success and um, pacemaker implantations. However, clinical results were more or less um, um, equal in both groups. Now we're working with the so-called next generation devices. They, um, uh, and I have the two um, players here. The Symmetris Accurate Neo is the self-expanding next generation device and the Sapien 3 is a uh, balloon expandable device. And both devices uh, have provided excellent data. As we just saw here, the Savi 1000 registry showed that in uh, uh, the Sapien, uh, the uh, Accurate Neo um, has promising uh, initial results with very low pacemaker rates and comparable um, rates of complications, as uh, has the Sapien 3 um, in more than 1,600 patients, excellent mortality and excellent PVL rates. However, to date, no comparative data between uh, those two THV exist. So um, we set out and uh, pooled the data from uh, three uh, large German uh, TAVI centers, the German Heart Center in Munich, University Hospital in Regensburg, and the Kirchhoff Clinic in Bad Nauheim to address this issue. So 
uh, between uh, two years, we, uh, from 1,121 patients treated with either the Accurate Neo or the Sapien 3, we um, extracted uh, the um, data, and in order to correct for inherent selection bias, we performed a one to two met propensity matching using important clinical variables, ECG variables, and anatomic variables. So in the end, we um, were able to find uh, for all the 311 patients treated with the accurate NEO, two matched pairs treated with the Sapien 3. And um, two endpoints were important in this study. First, a device-oriented endpoint, device success, and a patient-oriented endpoint, early safety at 30 days. The baseline characteristics after matching show that there was no significant difference between both groups anymore. It's a typical uh, collective of TAVI patients, mean age is above 80, and logistic Euro score in mean is 18, so a pretty um, normal TAVI collect collective. So let's go to the results. Here's uh, the main uh, result regarding device failure. You see here that um, the accurate NEO was associated with 11% of device failure and the Sapien 3 with 10%. This, this was not statistically significant. And uh, in the subgroup analysis of patients with mild to moderate calcification compared to severe calcification, as, as well as um, eccentric aortic anatomy, we could also not find a superiority of any device in, in these uh, subgroups. As device success is a, com a composite endpoint, we took a look at the uh, individual contributors. And as this slide shows, um, the accurate NEO was associated with a 5% um, PVL rate of two or more uh, compared to 2% with the Sapien 3, which was statistically significant. However, on the other side, uh, the rate of elevated gradients defined as uh, more than 20 millimeters of mercury was significantly lower with the accurate NEO. This resulted in the same antenna performance and thus in the same rate of device failure. Procedural data is displayed here. We see here that um, it was for the accurate NEO, um, pre-dilatation was almost performed in all cases, and the rate of post-dilatation was significantly higher as compared to the Sapien 3, and uh, a slightly more contrast was used, which was statistically significant. The in-hospital outcome is displayed here. Overall, we see um, a very low rate of uh, in-hospital mortality with 2 and 1 percent. There was no difference uh, in in-hospital in outcome except of a significantly higher pacemaker rate using the Sapien 3. Uh, days in hospital was slightly uh, longer um, uh, with the accurate NEO. Regarding the 30 days early, uh, composite early safety endpoint, again we saw no difference between both devices with 16 percent in both groups. And again, there was no um, statistically significant difference in the subgroups of severe calcified aortic anatomy or very eccentric anatomy. There's a, there's a trend towards a better um, uh, um, performance of the Sapien 3 in patients with um, eccentric annually, but it's only a trend and might also be due to chance. As the uh, early safety endpoint is a composite endpoint, we took a look at the individual contributors, and there was no statistical difference uh, in mortality, in stroke, in uh, vascular complication, life-threatening bleeding. We found there might be a chance finding in uh, two cases of coronary obstruction with accurate NEO, which was borderline significant. And there was, a, uh, at 30 days, the per new permanent pacemaker implantation was significantly higher with the Sapien 3, with 16.4% compared to 10.2% with the accurate NEO. Uh, this slide shows the mean transvalvular gradients at baseline discharge in 30 days, and it shows that uh, the um, gradients with the accurate NEO were at discharge and at 30 days significantly lower than with the um, Sapien 3. So the limitations and strengths of this analysis, it's obviously an observational study, and uh, the events were not independently adjudicated. There was no call-up analysis for the paravalvular leakage. However, um, uh, we were able to collect data from more than 1,000 patients treated for, uh, at three high volume centers, and uh, potential selection bias was accounted for by propensity matching. So in summary, I would like to uh, com conclude that um, in this uh, Morena registry, we found a uh, comparable um, rate of device failure with the accurate NEO compared to the Sapien 3, as well as the early safety composite endpoint at 30 days. The paravalvular leakage rate was low, but significantly higher with the accurate NEO compared to the Sapien 3, while on the other hand, the rate of elevated gradients was significantly lower 
and the rate uh, with, with the accurate NEO, the rate of new permanent pacemaker implantation was uh, also significantly lower with the accurate NEO compared to the Sapien 3. And we are looking forward to the results of the ongoing scope uh, one trial, which will surely uh, um, shed more light on a comparative and, uh, on a comparison of these two devices. Thank you very much. I think we can get started with the discussion. I would, I would like to encourage also the audience to be part you know, of this discussion. I would like to start with one Kim, because uh, you know the data that you presented are really impressive. A thousand patient registry. They started in 2014. What struck me was the fact that the rapid, uh, rapid pacing was about 50% of the patient. In, two, in, in 2017, is it still your current practice or this rate is getting lower? Um, uh, currently, the rate of rapid pacing is uh, zero because uh, actually you don't, don't need rapid pacing because the deployment of this device is uh, relatively easy and stable. And uh, in the IFU, in the official version, it is still recommended, but um, I hardly know um, anybody who would uh, uh, use rapid pacing. Maybe in some cases you uh, can recommend fast pacing in very, um, if the uh, pa uh, um, system is very, uh, there's a lot of movement, but uh, usually you don't need rapid pacing. Okay, I have a second question for uh, um, Olivier for about Morina study. It is, again, very important and reassuring to see that the accurate performs well compared to one of the best in class, THB, that we have currently. The point is that did you make, uh, you know, any kind of analysis to try to isolate the clinical and the anatomical variable that get you decide to go for one valve instead of the other. Because it is important, because this is not a randomized study. We have to wait for the result of the scope trial that is still enrolling. But I think it's important to understand also for the audience, how do you select the patients for this type of valve? Thank you, thank you very much. For, um, I think uh, in the Morena study, of, uh, it's obviously uh, observational data, and if you uh, um, do a direct comparison, you might be um, subject to selection bias. Um, we address this by using um, the aortic annular area, uh, degree of calcification, and, um, and we hope that this accounts somehow. It's, uh, as you said, it's not a randomized study. I personally uh, think that um, there is no exclusion criterion for, uh, for any valve. So um, in, in, in the daily practice, I, we don't, uh, at least I do not um, exclude, a, for example, a severely calcified patient for, for the self-expanding valve. Uh, um, in, in contrary, I sometimes maybe avoid a radial force in order to don't risk annular eruption in calcified anatomy. So this is not clear. That's why we did this subgroup analysis in order to see if we were able to would be able to find a. Pos yeah, of course, everything is uh, that, that's that's true. It's not a. Not, I mean, um, uh, it's a postdoc analysis, um, but it would have also been interesting to see if there was a signal towards a better performance of any device in, in different anatomies. So. Um, it's actually a very important question, and I think um, we would need special studies addressing, addressing this, and uh, uh, I hope that the scope study will shed more light into this. Andreas, you have some comments on that? Yes, in the previous uh, uh, session it was mentioned at the end uh, what is in the pipeline for the product, and maybe we should mention a l just some words that there is, of course, also a, a new iteration of the product, and what might, uh, the only f uh, percent that's not perfect, I would say, so far is the PVL, that's about 5%. It's respectable, but not perfect, and that's hopefully going to be better with the next version, which uh, features a better skirt. Uh, but it's in trials so far, so we don't have the results yet, of course. Okay, I would like to make, uh, to involve also the chairman to this discussion. <laughs> Because no, my point is, uh, we have seen 20 French. Do you have any insights to go with a, a smaller size? 
Yeah, I think that's a very important point. Um, uh, of course, the system is um, suitable for 18 French sheath as well, but there are um, several other solutions around. Um, for example, um, the inflatable uh, sheath so that you can go down to 13.5 percent. And um, I think this is very important um, in order to, to really um, give most uh, patients uh, the opportunity to get uh, treated uh, with, the de dis with this um, device. And with this, um, having said, I would like to, to ask uh, the panelists, uh, perhaps uh, everybody, for a short statement. Do you see, um, I, I totally understood that uh, the valve is suitable for all patients, but do you see a special subset which would benefit most from the um, features um, that we um, just described for, for the accurate device? So, Andreas, perhaps you can start. Uh, I would say in patients where we abso absolutely do not, do not want them to end up with a pacemaker, that's patients with bad LV function, then they would be very good candidates for this valve. Okay, one. Um, I think short coronary distance is an argument in favor of, um, there, there are a lot of arguments. So. <laughs> in, um, I think that uh, the horizontal aorta is very uh, well treatable with this valve because it nicely aligns, so uh, sometimes it's, it's a little, little easier compared to other valves. I think to me, is, you know, one of the things that I would like to think twice is the extreme severe calcification. In this case, I would, you know, because you need to end up going with, uh, you know, a post-dilatation, aggressive post-dilatation, so you can lose the benefit of a self-expandable valve also in terms of residual leak. But another thing uh, that, you know, make the difference for this valve compared to the others is the, uh, you know, the annular size that is medium to small. This valve is really fantastic because you don't have gradient at the end and you don't have problem and the alignment is almost perfect in all the case. You might have, you know, a little bit to work, a little bit more, one or two minutes more when you have very large annulus, but when you have small annulus with mild calcification, moderate calcification, this might be the valve to go. Also, you know, for the subannular functioning of the valve, etc., etc. So this, that's my point, I don't know yours before I, coming to the key learnings. I, I absolutely in line with what you just said. And um, perhaps the la last point which I would uh, like to make is um, it's very easy to implant in difficult anatomies like horizontal aorta. Yeah. We missed that part a little bit so far. Um, so everybody who is working with uh, TAVI devices knows that it may be some, um, sometimes cumbersome to, to really place a valve um, in, in the proper position um, if you have a horizontal aorta. And here, due to the self-aligning um, features of the valve, um, this is much, much easier than uh, for the most com um, competitors. Okay. Okay, it's up to me <clears throat> to deliver a few key learnings. So, <clears throat> this is my disclosure. So what we can say about the session that we have seen today, that the accurate neoaortic valve system allows for an intuitive and predictable implantation procedure thanks to its unique valve design and delivery system that is quite straightforward. The second point that I would like to share with you is that one year follow-up data from all cameras, Safi transfemoral registry, a thousand patients demonstrate excellent outcome in terms of comparable VAC2 safety and efficacy that is similar to the best-in-class THV valve, uh, as this is at least for what we have seen with the data that we have uh, uh, so far. Data from the Morina study indicate comparable good safety and performance data when compared to the Sabin 3 system. And what is important to highlight is the lowest rate of pacemaker rate that we can observe in literature that is less than 10%. So this is my last slide just to make an overview on the portfolio of the Boston valves. We have two different animals. The one on the left is the accurate. On the right, we have the Lotus Edge that in the next upcoming months is going to come up again in the market. 
Looking at the features, we have self-expansion against control mechanical expansion, supraannular working leaflets compared to the intraannular valve positioning, transfemoral or transfemoral plus two different access, transaortic or transepical. So based on this assumption, we have two complementary valve systems that's taking into account of all the clinical and the anatomical different features of the patients. Basically, I'm referring to different size, access, coronary height, valve anatomy, calcification, pacemaker risk. Probably with having these two valves on board may allow us to treat a quite wide range of different patients that goes from the more gentle to the more scaring one. Thank you for your attention.